Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. I want to thank uh, those of you that have written in with questions for me. Uh, I'm going to do a video today to answer one of those questions. One of you wrote in and, and asked me to do a short video on um, the differences between subcutaneous and intramuscular testosterone injections. And, uh, you know, this is a good topic to talk about because, um, you know, there, there are a lot of videos out there about this subject, but unfortunately, there's still not a lot of clarity about it. Uh, as always on this channel, I like to show you guys the studies and the data so that when, um, when I say something, when I recommend something to you, it's not just me pulling it out of you know where, I've actually got some, uh, some evidence to back up what I'm saying. So, so let's get into it a little bit. Um, you know, I started off initially, probably like most guys, doing uh, exclusively intramuscular injections. And um, gosh, many years ago, I don't remember how, it's been, been at least four or five, maybe six years, years ago, I switched to subcutaneous injections with, with good results. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit as the video goes on. This is a, a, a picture here of the three main injections that we do in the medical world, uh, only two of which actually apply to our, our topic today. So the one that doesn't apply is this intradermal injection. And this is a very, you know, you can see a very shallow angle injection. It doesn't go very deep. It goes actually still within the dermis. So we have the epidermis and then the dermis. So these are the kind of injections that you get done. Like if you go and get, um, you know, filler done, like cosmetic filler in your face, um, that's about as deep as uh, most fillers go. There are some fillers that actually go quite a bit deeper than that, but typically that's this is something done in the cosmetic dermatology world. Um, now here we go with the subcutaneous one. You can see the angle's a little bit steeper, right around 45 degrees. And you can see, you know, we're passing through the epidermis, through the dermis itself, and then down into the subcutaneous tissue, but not all the way down into the muscle. So the sub subcutaneous tissue it consists of you know, various proteins, collagen, but also fat. And then this vertical one here is obviously this, uh, this injection goes all the way down into the muscle. And so um, that's, uh, you know, typically done at about a 90 degree angle, you know, give or take. And then this picture here shows how I think most of us, uh, <laughs> most of us do sub subcutaneous injections. You take a little pinch of skin, whether it's you know on your thigh, most most guys do subcutaneous injections like around their belly button, uh, maybe on, around their love handles. Um, I I mix it up. I, I inject in a number of different locations, uh, but regardless of where you inject, uh, if you're doing subcutaneous injections, you know the the tissue all looks the same. You, you'll you'll pinch the tissue up here, and then you put the the needle in at this again roughly 45 degree angle, and that'll get you into the uh, into the subcutaneous tissue, which is exactly where you want to be. So let's talk a little bit about the absorption of testosterone when you use one of the two uh, injection methods. You know, the, it, it's commonly thought, and it's not entirely incorrect, that um, you, know, you will get faster absorption when you inject intramuscularly. And that's, you know, th with the idea being obviously that there's a greater amount of blood flow or blood supply to a muscle than into the subcutaneous uh, space. And that, and that is true. Um, but what, what you'll find if, you know, if you look up in physiology books is the, the blood flow to different muscles varies widely uh, at rest. So like a good example is the deltoid muscles get a lot more blood flow. They're a lot more vascular. They have a lot more uh, small capillary beds than the glutes, for example. So injecting the same amount of testosterone in the deltoid uh, versus the glute may give you slightly different you know, peaks um, and absorption curves. And um, whether that has any you know, meaningful clinical significance is up for debate, but it's just a, a fact of physiology. But it's important to remember that um, it's not so much the direct absorption into the into the bloodstream that you know leads to a detectable level of testosterone in the blood it's really the absorption of the testosterone esters into the lymphatic system and the lymphatic system is uh, transports lymph where you know adjacent to veins but it's their, they are their own vessels and they transport lymphatic fluid constantly circulating it throughout the body 
and they um, eventually uh, drain into the thoracic duct, which you know goes into the systemic circulation. So um, this this picture right here, I think, demonstrates that pretty elegantly. So if so, on the left we have um, an injection of testosterone directly into a muscle, and on the right we have it uh, directly injected into the subcutaneous space. So in this case, on the little diagram here, it's in the glute, and then here it's like in the periumbilical. Uh, subcutaneous tissue. So, um, so let's start with the muscle here. So you have this depot of yeah. uh, testosterone here um, with the ester. It leaks out into the uh, interstitium, and then from there it will uh, be hydrolyzed and go into uh, like a small capillary blood vessel, and off it goes into the systemic circulation. As you can see in the subcutaneous injection, the exact same thing happens, but because there's less blood flow, you, you can see the blood vessel, the size on the diagram is a little bit smaller. That uh, happens to a lesser degree. And um, then, now the bulk of the testosterone actually doesn't go down into the vessel, it gets absorbed into the lymphatics. And what you see here is that the, this ester, it goes into the lymphatic tissue and then eventually gets dumped into the systemic circulation where then it is uh, cleaved uh, into its active component. The, the ester is cleaved. And the exact same thing happens, obviously, in the subcutaneous side. But you see this squiggly line here in the lymphatic side on the intramuscular uh, portion, portion of this diagram. That, um, that's because this rate of absorption into the lymphatic tissue is, why, is highly variable. And um, this is one of the reasons why, you know, when you look in the literature, when you compare these two delivery methods that, you know, the the studies out there consistently show that subcutaneous injections tend to give you uh, steadier, more predictable, um, you know, absorption curves. Regardless of where you inject subcutaneously, the absorption curves look roughly the same. Whereas, depending on which muscle you choose and what's going on with the muscle at the time, the uh, rate of absorption and transport through the lymphatic vessels and then ultimately into the systemic circulation can be can be quite a bit different. Again, whether that has any uh, clinical relevance to your signs and symptoms is up for debate. Maybe for some people it does, but many you know in many cases for other people it does not. So let's talk about the lymphatics real quick. We'll do a little quick physiology lesson. So you know, uh, fluid gets lymph lymph fluid goes through the lymphatic vessels, and it is moved along through two primary pumping processes. There's intrinsic pumping and then there's extrinsic pumping. And this will make sense here as I explain it, but the intrinsic pumping, you know, basically there are these little thin, wispy, smooth muscle, uh, muscular units that line the lymphatic vessels and they just slowly kind of squeeze and there are valves, you know, so that to prevent backflow. So you have one way flow through the lymphatic, kind of like with a vein, you know, there are valves in the veins as well. So you have this intrinsic flow uh, that's you know caused by these you know wispy little smooth muscle units that surround the lymphatics, and those tend to transport you know the lymphatic fluid at a relatively constant rate. Now you also have extrinsic pumping, and the extrinsic pumping is the uh, it's basically like the intermittent uh, exertional pressure of the surrounding muscles. So, for example, like a lymphatic vessel that goes through your calf, if you're doing a set of calf raises or you're sprinting, uh, going for a jog, you know, those muscles are actively contracting. Well, as they contract, you know, they, they not only are squeezing, you know, the veins and the arteries, but they're squeezing the lymphatic vessels as well. And that helps propel the lymphatic fluid through, uh, through the lymph vessels. And so you have both of those processes going on all the time. Now. Um, the difference is, in terms of these injections, subcutaneous tissue, um, you know, extrinsic pumping is really not an issue in, when you do a subcutaneous injection because you're not injecting anywhere really near or inside a muscle um, and you're not injecting into lymphatics that are traveling through muscle tissue. So, um, you know, lymph, lymph drainage from subcutaneous tissue, it's mostly intrinsic. Um, now, muscle lymph flow is mostly extrinsic and it's influenced by physical activity as I was, you know, suggesting earlier. So, so that has a lot to do with rates of absorption um, and how quickly, 
you know, these testosterone esters get into your serum is whether you, um, you know, have a lot of extra, you know, extrinsic uh, pumping, you know, from an active muscle that's moving things along at a faster rate than uh, would be the case if you're just relying on intrinsic pumping. I hope that, I hope I'm explaining that, that correctly. So, um, so that's, that essentially explains a lot of the differences in, um, in, in what you'll see and what you'll experience with uh, these two different injections. Again, I, I'll, I'll keep back, you know, I'll come back to keep saying the same thing is like whether this has much clinical re relevance for you as an individual it, is very difficult to say, but it, um, you know, it, 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 does, it does show up in some of these studies. And um, you know, ultimately, it's going to be up to you whether you think um, you know this is relevant to your to your protocol. Okay, so the big question always is: Can you get good levels using a subcutaneous route versus an intramuscular route? We know, I mean, all the initial studies with testosterone were done with intramuscular injections. Uh, there's studies going back, you know, 75 years on that. We know you get good levels with IM, but can you get similar levels with subcutaneous injections? And the answer is, yeah, for the most part, you certainly can. So this is a study from the journal Sexual Medicine back from 2015. It's a pharma-sponsored study, uh, pharmacokinetic profile of subcutaneous testosterone enanthate delivered via a novel pre-filled single-use auto-injector, phase two study. Okay, and that auto injector is this uh, Ziosted. I, I, I've seen these before. I've never prescribed them. I don't know anybody that's ever used them. They look kind of like an EpiPen. If you ever have seen those, you know, epinephrine pens that people use when they have anaphylactic shock. Um, I don't think that these get used very much. They're it's just like a cute and ex cute meaning expensive delivery method, um, and. But, I don't think that there's much popularity. If, if you do use one of these, let me know in the comments and uh, let me know what you think about it. But uh, and I, I think they're just trying to be clever <laughs> when they came when they came up with this product. But regardless, in this study, here are some levels based on two different dosing regimens. So they tried 50 milligrams uh, once a week with these auto injectors, and that's this uh, open circle here. You know, as you can see, I mean, that's a that's not an adequate dose. And so you get these kind of crappy levels here that essentially return to baseline, you know, at the end of each week because, you know, they were dosing it once a week. But when you do 100 milligrams a week, you know, after about week four, you start getting some, you know, you, you get a relatively steady state level here with troughs that are just above 600. So like a pretty reasonable, you know, trough level Um considering you're only getting 75 milligrams of, of testosterone. And that compares, as you can see with the chart below, it, very favorably with what 100 milligrams of intramuscular testosterone enanthate looks like. Um, now this particular graph, they, they went out past six weeks, but if you look at, let's look at like week five and six, for example. And by the way, th these are all trough levels. Um, so on, on the bottom chart here. So you're consistently seeing essentially the same thing. You're seeing levels, you know, well above 600, probably between six and 700, maybe 650, which is exactly what you're seeing with the subcutaneous. So you get very, very similar um, serum levels once you reach a steady state, um, whether you do this intramuscularly or whether you do it, um, you know, via subcutaneous route. So, so that's, that looks very promising. Here's another study that shows that shows essentially the same thing. Um, this is from uh, this is from the journal, the American Journal of uh, Health Systems and Pharmacology, Pharmacokinetics, Safety and Patient Acceptability of Subcutaneous versus Intramuscular Testosterone Injection for Gender Affirming Therapy, a pilot study. God, that's a mouthful. Uh, when is this? When was this done? It's uh, yeah, it's not that old. 2016. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, a lot of these studies um, looking at IM versus sub Q were done in transgender populations. I'm not sure why. But uh, you know, many of the studies were done that way. And what you can see from this chart here, so the way the study was set up, these were all transgender uh, female to male individuals who had been on testosterone for a long period of time. Like these were not new, these were not new patients. And so for the first three weeks, they kept them on their standard dose of testosterone because they were doing well on it. And it was done intramuscularly. They, all of them had been on IM before entering the study. And... Um, 
you can see here, so uh, weeks one, two, and three, these were the average levels that they were getting. Now, this is, uh, it's in nanomoles per liter per milligram, uh, because I think, yeah, the study was done in Canada, so they like nanomoles up there. So if you want to, you can do the math. You don't really need to, to see that, um, you know, the levels are pretty consistent. So we're looking at average levels with obviously some variation between 0 0.24 and 0 0.28 okay and then for uh starting in week four through 11 they switched so they kept the dose the same and they moved them all over to subcutaneous injections and we're also checking again trough levels on day seven these are once a week injections and i mean look at the numbers here you're basically you have very similar levels What's the low here? The lowest they got was 0 0.26, it looks like, and the highest was 0 0.33. Not statistically uh, different um, from what they were experiencing with intramuscular injections. So, so this study, again, supports, uh, as does the previous study, yeah, you can absolutely get uh, very adequate and almost, almost identical levels whether you inject subcutaneously or intramuscularly. And that was a conclusion of the study here. They say, our data demonstrate that when testosterone cypionate is injected sub subcutaneously at a weekly interval, mean serum levels remain stable and within the normal range, a similar pattern of mean serum testosterone levels has been reported with weekly IM injections of testosterone, exactly. And then down here, near identical serum concentrations of total and free testosterone seven days apart, just prior to injections, further supports consistency of serum testosterone levels with subcutaneous injections yeah it's absolutely true okay so we know we know we can get we can get good levels subcutaneously we can get levels that are you know for all intents and purposes essentially the same as intramuscular um, uh, levels but some people say well you don't want to inject into subcutaneous tissue because that's you know there's fat there and we know that there's an aromatase enzyme that lives there so you may spike your estradiol if you do a subcutaneous injection and then you know there are folks also that say that uh, the you know the five alpha reductase enzyme is concentrated in the skin so you know you're, you're dumping a bunch of testosterone near the skin and so maybe you're going to get spikes in dht uh, unfortunately we, we have some studies to to look at that and see whether that's the case so this is one of them here. In this case, they use testosterone undecanoate, the very long-acting form of testosterone. Uh, but there are other studies with enanthate that show uh, essentially the same findings. So this one is pharmacokinetics and acceptability of subcutaneous injections of testosterone undecanoate. Uh, this is from April 2019 and um, published in the Journal of uh, the Endocrine Society. So very prestigious journal, all right? Um, so they were giving these uh, particular patients a uh, thousand milligrams at a time. Um, <laughs> incidentally, you know, a thousand milligrams of, of testosterone and decan 8 is four mLs. That's a big shot. And I, I can imagine, and I think they mentioned it in here, a subcutaneous injection of four mLs just doesn't sound that pleasant to me. It sounds kind of painful. Um, and they do mention in here that the pain, not initially, but the pain the next day was worse with a subcutaneous injection. Um, but that's only because they were injecting four mLs. Like all the other studies um, that I've shown you so far, uh, all said that there was a lot less pain with subcutaneous injections. But that's because they were, you know, injecting like normal volumes. <laughs> we're putting four freaking CCs uh, into the into the subcutaneous space. So, anyway, I, I digress. So, what about DHT and E2 levels? So here here's a nice chart from this uh, this article. Um, the first one is the serum testosterone levels. So as we've talked about already. You can see the curves are very, very similar. The subcutaneous um, group, tiny bit less in this particular case. So not clinically significant, they said, but a slight, slightly less. When we come over and we look at uh, DHT, you do see a, a rise in DHT that is above what was experienced in the IM group, at least initially. So maybe there is something to this sub-Q, you know, injecting near the dermis thing. Um, but interestingly enough, as time went on, the, um, the green line here, which is the, um, the subcutaneous group, their DHT levels actually ended up, uh, by the time they needed their next injection, being significantly lower than the intramuscular group. So, 
you get a little bit more extra DHT at the beginning and then a little bit less at the end as compared to intramuscular, at least with undecanoate. And then finally, uh, the estradiol curve here, very, very similar. If anything, you know, you do get, at least according to this study, a little bit more estradiol um, out of the gate with an intramuscular injection, but then um, kind of the reverse of what we saw with DHT is that the subcutaneous group had slightly higher estradiol levels towards the end just before you know they were due for their next in injection as compared to the intramuscular group. So again, th these were not um, these were not considered to be of clinical significance because the patients didn't report feeling any different. There were just some minor differences in the numbers. So so take it for what it's worth. You know, ultimately, if you the delivery method that you decide, you know, even if whether it's injection, injecting, whether it's transdermal, I mean, there's pros and cons to all of that. Um, and the same thing goes with these injections. Um, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I present both options to my patients and I let them decide. Um, we know that you can get essentially identical levels of testosterone, DHT, and estradiol for the most part, with some minor variations, at least according to these studies. Um, all the studies, with the exception of the undecanoate one, which I think doesn't count, showed that there was overall less pain and discomfort with um, uh, with subcutaneous injections. But one of the things I will say that they didn't mention in all these studies, and that I have seen clinically, and, and maybe you've experienced too, is um, you know some people have kind of low-grade local reactions to the carrier oils, or maybe to some of the proteins that are dissolved in the carrier oils. Uh, or perhaps to the preservatives. And so I have seen guys that have gotten like little welts, uh, sometimes little hard nodules under the skin that sometimes take a few weeks to go away um, that uh, I have not seen when they do intramuscular injections. So, you know, if you are getting these irritating nodules or these, these little local, they sort of look like a hive, like a local, you know, area of raised erythema, might be a little itchy, might not. You know, if you're getting those, then you may want to either switch carrier oils if you want to stick with subcutaneous injections, or just switch to intramuscular injections, because that th then you won't you won't get that. Um, one thing I'll say is, you know, these were all um, they they didn't study all the different. There are multiple different carrier oils, as I'm sure you're all aware. Grapeseed oil, uh, there's castor oil, there's MCT, you know, and there's um, in different oils that are used in other countries. They didn't use. Um, they all used pure products, so by pure I meaning like there were no testosterone blends. Like um, like they, in Europe, they use Sustanon, which is a four testosterone blend. I, I can't think of a reason necessarily why it would be different with a blend, but it would be good to see, um, you know, just a study to confirm that. And none of these studies used uh, testosterone blends. So the advantage of a sub-Q injection also, I should mention, is, you know, again, if you, you're on TRT, you're probably, at least you should more than likely be on it for life. So you can imagine, you know, if you're pinning into a, a muscle, even if it's once a week, um, you know, for 40 years or 30 years, there's a potential there to get some trauma there, obviously, and um, potential for scar tissue to develop. And then, of course, if you're doing injections more than once a week, which is quite common and probably optimal, you know, do you really want to be violating, you know, your, your gluteal muscle or your vastus lateralis muscle in some cases, you know, twice a week for the next 30 plus years, you know, and end up developing a significant amount of scar tissue. The other thing to think about, it probably doesn't apply to most of you, but, you know, there's a lot of old guys running around there with low testosterone who also happen to be on anticoagulant medications, you know, things like Warfarin, uh, Xarelto, you know, all, um, all these sorts of things for like atrial fibrillation or stroke prevention, or, you know, maybe they've had a previous clot or PE. Well, I mean, every time that they inject into a vascular space or into a vascular tissue, like, uh, like a muscle, I mean, you run the risk of developing a hematoma because that's what those medicines do. They make you bleed. So, um, if you're one of those gentlemen, then you, Maybe you want to do. You maybe want to consider um, using a uh, a subcutaneous route with a smaller needle, because um, you know you don't want to risk getting a big muscle hematoma, which can be painful, and I know can be like you know you get this big purple discoloration that it can take weeks to go away. You don't want to you don't want to have to deal with that. And then finally, you know, it's it, 
I don't know. I like using these smaller gauge needles that you can do with subcutaneous injections. Um, I've got one here, for example. So, I mean, this is an insulin syringe, 1 ml with a 27 gauge, you know, itty bitty tiny little needle on it. And um, these are just really easy. They're convenient. You don't even feel a 27 gauge needle. It's tiny. Now, it does take a little bit longer to pull the oil up. It does take a little bit longer because it's a small diameter needle, you know, to get it, uh, you know, to get the oil, you know, out of the syringe. But it's not a big deal. It's um, it just takes a you know a few a few extra seconds really. Um, so for me, I prefer this. Uh, but you know, again, ultimately it's up to you. If you are doing well on intramuscular injections, you don't mind doing intramuscular injections. By all means, stay on uh, intramuscular. If you're going to do IM, you know, I think you should do relatively shallow IM. You don't want to go too deep. Um, you got to know. You can get into trouble with intramuscular injections if you don't know the anatomy. Any of you that have ever hit your sciatic nerve, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, you have to have a little bit of familiarity. If you're going to do a deeper intramuscular injection, uh, by deeper, I mean, you know, using like anything greater than a one inch needle, um, you might want to be familiar with some of the vascular and uh, nerve bundle structures that are that are with, that are in the muscle that you're uh, attempting to inject into. Because if you hit one of those, you'll probably know it, and uh, you're not going to want to do that again. So I, I recommend a shallow IM injection if you're going to do um, an intramuscular injection. So that's with you know something an inch long needle or less. Um, you know, just to barely get in the muscle. And you know, again, if you're if you're fatty. You know, you may not be able. This is another thing to consider. Uh, you, the needles may not be long enough for you, okay? And so that's something that you need to work on. And you may not. You may think that you're doing an intramuscular injection, but no, you're just putting it into your into your fat ass. Um, and it's going to take. Uh, well, it's essentially going to absorb like a subcutaneous injection for the most part. So, okay, guys. Um, I hope I answered that question. Uh, thanks again for sending it to me. Uh, again, please keep the questions coming. I will, um, you know, I, I won't be able to address every single question that I get, but this one I thought was good. Uh, it's one that I get repeatedly, um, and I think it's, you know, it's worth talking about. So I'm going to keep putting out videos for you guys as long as you, you want me to. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you next time.